Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today one of your beloved children, Lincoln Scott Lessman. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now if you will turn your insert over, we will sing Children of the Heavenly Father. John and Dorothy Tillman, 
and Hank and Elaine Lesman. Great uncles Rich Imps and Joe Tillerman, Tim Lesman, and great aunt Nancy DeVos. So before we go to our special music, um, I was coaching Brent on reading this, and um, I think I told him to do like the ones in parentheses, just do them as, you know, Derek and Angie DeVos, Derek and Elizabeth DeVos, and include those names. So if your name wasn't mentioned, it's my fault because I didn't explain it perfectly. You did a wonderful job, though. You, you just left out a few names. Okay, but we're still not going to do the special music yet. Because I um, would like to invite the children to come forward for a special message real quick here. Any children come forward and who knows what this is? It's kind of pushed in on one side, but right? Okay. So did you know that these were invented by a long time ago by, yeah, come on forward, any children? by an Italian priest who wanted to have a way for children to have something special for them. So if you look at this carefully, it kind of looks like, if you hold it, Brent, I want to demonstrate. So if you cross your hands like this and bow your head, you know, that would be when you could say your prayers, or you could get a blessing. So if you cross your hand, bow your head, they might come up and say, you are a loved child of God. You are precious. You are one of Jesus' children. You are beloved. You are so wonderful. Come here, kids. You are a beloved child of God, and you are a beloved child of God. And you are a beloved child of God. Mary, you're a beloved child of God. Olivia, beloved child of God. Izzy, did I get you? Beloved child of God. How about you, Louis? You are a beloved child of God. Did I get you a You're a beloved child of God. Some of you got a couple of blessings, but that's okay too. So, this was a way that people could get their blessing or say their prayers. And what was one of Lincoln's favorite things to eat? Pretzels. Pretzels. Yay! So after the service, after it's over, and I'll tell you when, you're going to go and get our secret stash of pretzels for everybody to have one. And you're going to hand them out. What are you going to say when you give it to them? Jesus loves you. Yes, okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. The way that you share God's love. Special music.
Then children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them. But Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And he laid his hands on them and went on his way. Message and have a better idea. And we're going to start with 
one of the very first stories in the Bible. God has created this perfect, beautiful world. Perfect. And Adam and Eve made some really bad choices. So bad that for their own protection, God banned them from the garden and sent them out. Where was God? A lot of times when people hear that story, they just assume that God banned them from the garden and chased them out and slammed the door. But if you keep reading the scriptures, you'll see that God went with Adam. God killed one of his own beautiful creatures and took the fur and clothed them. And then he helped them. And one of Eve's sons, born after this time, was named after God. God helped me. With the help of God, I delivered a son. God went with them into exile. He went with them. There's a couple of stories. Um, I'm not going to have time probably for all of them. But let's talk about um, how many of you have ever attended something like Red Cross's swimming lessons? You remember those? And you learned to swim because there was classes and lessons? In 1904 in New York, a side wheel paddle boat, the General Slocum, was carrying more than 1,300 people on a church outing up the East River near Manhattan when it caught fire. It burned quickly, causing massive panic on board and pitching old and young people into the water. And more than 1,000 people died. This distressed a young newspaper reporter from Rhode Island, Wilbur E. Longfellow, who realized the nation faced a growing problem. And he introduced water safety initiatives. Longfellow saw the need for a nationwide program of swimming and life-saving training and engaged in a one-man crusade to see this occur. In 1914, so then 10 years later, he enlisted the participation of the Red Cross to ensure the success of his aim, the waterproofing of America. And on February 1st, 1914, Longfellow began the Red Cross Water Safety Program and established the Red Cross Life Saving Corps. I hand wrote a note in here somewhere. Oh, here we go. Now, a lot of you, there's not a rude person in this room that hasn't been exposed, especially to COVID, during COVID. How many of you realize the importance of washing your hands? Every bathroom uh, you go in now, employers must wash your hands, you know. And in the one I just lost this morning in Caribou, employees must wash your hands. It's where the fun begins. Ignat Semelis, called the father of hand hygiene, hygiene, was kind of the chief doctor over two OB places, two buildings. In one building, um, maybe the women of less you know, concern would go and they would have their babies delivered by midwives. And in the other building, doctors would come to deliver the babies. There was a higher death rate in the doctor's hospital for women dying after childbirth than there was in the one with the midwives. And in that seminalist would do autopsies. And one day um, in 1844, one of his friends died. And he knew what was wrong with his friend. He had a bad infection. But he still did the autopsy. And what he found was the same kind of germs were found in the women that had died after childbirth. Now what was happening there was the doctors had another building close by where they would do autopsies. People that died from whatever, they would go in and they would learn and they would explore. And when they were finished, they would go from that building to the building where the women were that needed care. They didn't take off their clothes and they didn't wash their hands. So this Dr. Ignac made the connection. And he made it a rule. When you are done with the autopsies, before you go into this building to deliver a baby, you will wash your hands. 
You will wash them with bleach. You will wash them until you no longer smell like a cadaver. And he instituted those rules. And he made it law. And immediately, the death toll in that hospital fell so that it was comparable with the other hospital. So he was on to something. And he told his colleagues, somehow, we are carrying something into these people that we have to wash our hands for. And you would think they would all go, yes. And instead, they all went, don't be ridiculous. That is not an issue. And they were mean to this guy, and they made fun of him. And I think some of it was his fault. He was kind of an abrupt guy, you know, instead of helping him learn why it mattered, he kind of tried to enforce his opinion. And he kind of got drummed out of being in the hospital, and he went somewhere else. And he wrote a book, kind of a treatise, on why you need to wash your hands, and it will help prevent infection. And when he wrote his book, okay, I got the book, here it is, you know. Everybody was making fun of him because he didn't, uh, it, from the sound of the name, he wasn't an American. He didn't have the proper grammar, maybe he misspelled some words, and therefore they dismissed it. Way before he made the connection, you can find in the Bible the importance that God placed on washing your hands. This day, it's a standardized rule. You aren't going to serve food. You are not going to operate on anybody. You're not even going to go into the surgery area unless you have scrubbed. And they have special ways you scrub. You don't just wash your hands on the sink. Now, you start up here. You work your way down and you rinse your way down. God gave the tools to save lives regarding this and helped encourage people to find out and make them proof. But they were locked into their mindset that we know best. And they dismissed it. Now one of the scriptures I want to read to you. I've got to find it. Hang on. Okay. John 5, uh, verses 17 and 18. I'll give you the context first. It's a Sabbath day. This is a holy day. Right? And Jesus has gone somewhere and seen somebody that needed healing. And he told them, get up and walk. And heal them. Now the people witnessing this confronted him. Who do you think you are? You are healing on the Sabbath? What? And Jesus answered them, my father is still working and I also am working. And because he said that, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. My father is working right now, and therefore I'm still working. And they're all upset. How dare he call God his father and curing people on the Sabbath? What? And they decided even more strongly to kill him than they had been before. They're going to kill him. He wasn't just breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, therefore making himself equal to God. So they're locked into their mindset. And here's what they miss, and here's what I want you to not miss. What they should have been asking, what is God working on? What are you working on, Jesus? If you follow Jesus' life in the Bible, and uh, it's summarized beautifully in Acts, it's 10.38. Jesus went about doing good. He went about making the invisible God visible. He went about helping people to understand what God is really like. And if they would have asked that question, what is he working on? They would have stumbled on the answer, making this world better, helping people's lives be better. So over and over, when you look through history, and you've got the hand-washing story, and you've got the swimming story, you've got the scripture that we just read, that God and Jesus 
are consulting with each other, which is another word for intercede. Comparing notes, making plans, looking for how, how can we make this better? What can we do? I think I have another story. Um, before I get to that one, though, yeah, I'll wait with that one. So I'm going to tell you a story at the end that you know. Most of you have heard this. The prodigal son. I'll give you the context. So there's two brothers. One's a faithful, loyal, hard worker, does everything right. And one's a little bit on the wild side. And he goes to his dad and says, hey, dad, give me my inheritance now. And the father does. He gives it to him. And the kid takes off, and he wastes it, and he does you know, terrible things. And he gets to the point where he's starving. He decides, I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to tell him, I'm not, even, I'm not worthy to be a son. Just make me be a servant. And we always ask ourselves, are we the older brother in this story? Or are we the younger son in this story? And we play all the roles. When Jesus is telling this story, the example of the father is God. So here you have a father, the two sons. The one son has repented. He's sorry. He has experienced tough love at its finest. He's coming back. And here's where I want you to really tune in. He's rehearsing what he's going to say to his dad. I'm not worthy to be your son. Just make me a servant. The father sees him from a distance. And when he sees him, he runs to him. The father runs to his son. And then he goes on and says, he fell on him, kissing his neck and holding him and hugging him. From a distance he saw him. That tells us that the father was watching and looking for his son. He runs to him. That's not a casual thing. The son hasn't even said he's sorry or he's changed his ways. He's just walking to his father. He hasn't spoken a word. And his father, our father, runs to him, falls on him, hugs him, kisses his neck. And you can go on and read that story for yourself. And you should. It's a good story. When's, where is God? You can know, and this is one of Martin Luther's favorite, this is my Lutheran stuff still now, it's my favorite theology, it's my favorite theology, it's the theology of the cross. And what that means is while we were separated from God, while we were all estranged from God, God is working on a plan with Jesus and the Holy Spirit to make our lives better, to improve this world, to save us. For Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn it, but to save it. You're working on this plan. Even in our brokenness, here's this plan. And there's this cross. And the theology of the cross is that even before we knew there was a problem, God was working on a solution to bring life and healing and salvation to the world. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden for their own sake, God was right behind them. When this young man turned his back on God and desolate living and promiscuous and sin after sin, he didn't even get a chance to say, I'm sorry, before the Father was running to him and knocking him over and holding him and kissing him and loving him. Now here's a story I think you're going to surprise you. Looking at the backup camera. How many of you have a backup camera in your car? I know. Okay, yeah, I got one. Both of my cars don't have one. Did you know the first ever backup camera was in the 1956 Buick Centurion designed by Chuck Jordan? The four-passenger car looked like a vehicle of the future. It had a transparent bubble roof, fiberglass body, and a television camera mounted. 
the center of its jet-inspired trunk. The instrument paddle featured a receiver that would display images transmitted to it from the camera. <coughs> and as beautiful as the Centurion was, it was only a concept car. The U.S. Department of Transportation and National Highway Safety Administration announced on March 31st, 2014, that all vehicles, including vans, trucks, and SUVs, would have to be equipped with rear view visibility systems by May 1st, 2018. How many, you know, somebody knew the math, 19, 2018, subtract 1956. The ability and the knowledge was there for all of those years. I feel like people, you know, like, why aren't we having these things now? God moves as fast as we let God move. 1956, there it was. And I think, let me just look. Um, Volvo also unveiled its concept in 1972 of an experimental safety car. The Swedish company invented the modern three-point seatbelt, like in all of our vehicles, in 1959 and allowed other automakers to use their patent. It cemented Volvo's name in the public consciousness as a safety powerhouse, but he didn't charge anyone else for the design, the recipe for making that three-point safety harness that we all have in our cars today, because he felt like the lives saved far outweighed any amount of money that he could have made from it. Um, we, and let me tell you what else was in that car. This is 1972. It had seat belts that pulled tight, front and rear airbags, and rear and front bumpers that it could, could absorb impact. It featured an automatic fuel shutoff mechanism and wipers for the rear window and headlights. But, and also it had this backup safety camera. So here's all these innovations in 1972. The thing of it is, when the seatbelt was invented, and one that would keep your chest upright, you know, it wasn't, it was made mandatory at one point, finally, to put it in all the vehicles. You had to have one in the vehicle, but you weren't required to use it. We can probably, most of us, remember when they made it legal that you had to wear, or illegal, if you did wear it. You had to have the seatbelt. I know that God was kind the inspiration of all of these wonderful things that save lives and help make our lives better. But we're a little stubborn, like Adam and Eve, we think we know best, and we carry on and we do our own thing. And sometimes it, it messes up with us. John 1, 1 through 5, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word is Logos. And this was the name of Jesus before he was Jesus, was Logos. He was in the beginning with God. Here's the part, to him. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. Not one thing has been made without Jesus. And they're interceding and talking, how can we make life better? What can we do? How can we save these people from themselves? A couple of days ago, I was in conversation with this wonderful musical family over here. And one of the songs they wanted to sing is, Thy Will Be Done. And I said, no, you're not singing that. I don't want one person in that room to look at what went on here and say, this was God's will. This was not God's will. This is a fallen world. This is where things happen. God's will is for us to work together, to take care of each other, and help make things easier and safer and kinder and more loving 
Help the hunger be fed. God has already put into place the technology, the counselors. How many people in this room, probably several of you, went into whatever your occupation is because you wanted to help people? I recently um, had a mammogram, and all the women here, yes, mm -hmm. not easily done. So here's this little tiny woman trying to reach around me, and you can just see this is a challenging job for her. And I thought to myself, you know, nobody signs up for this. Why was she doing what she was doing? Did someone in her life have breast cancer? Did she think, I'm going to do this? I'm going to just, you know, that's going to be my job, my occupation. Think of the other doctors and the fun jobs they have. They did it because they wanted to help. Because they wanted to make a difference. We have firefighters and first responders and farmers and teachers and 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 and. Nurses, doctors, secretaries, all of you. Wanting to make a difference. And your inspiration, your encouragement, and the ability for you to reach those dreams is from the Holy Spirit. The power to become what you dream to be is from the Holy Spirit. Guiding you, helping you, encouraging you. We can pray. They're going to sing that song, by the way. Because when they sang it to me, I was like, oh. The Holy Spirit outbid me, you're right, you need to sing that song. Because we do want God's will to be done. We want God to succeed in making this world safe for our children, for our families. And I think about all the counselors and people here in this room and in this community that are thinking, how can I help and what can I do? So now I'm going to go back to the first question I asked you. And I wanted you to think about it. Where was God in this picture? God was already at work, working on the technology to help this never happen again. God ran, ran to them to hold them and love them. Let them know they are precious in His sight and cry with them. A friend was sharing a story, was it last night you were talking about Lazarus? What he didn't say was when he met with Mary and Martha. And if he had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And he's like, they will be. He will be resurrected. They're like, well, we know in the future what we're talking about right now. Jesus wept. When we mourn, when we grieve, you need to know that God is grieving, that Jesus is crying. And when you hear that Jesus is interceding at the right hand of God, do not picture them arguing. Picture two people trying to come with the power of the Holy Spirit to the best solution, to the best outcome possible for everyone involved. And it might take years. You think back on any of these stories I just read to you, and I had more. It took years. It took years before Big Max controversial idea of washing hands became one of the primary reasons that more people did not die from COVID. God is right here. God has never left you. He follows us into the wilderness, into the pain, places, theology of the cross. God is already at work before you even call on Him to bring healing life and hope to let you know you are loved and all of us have the opportunity to be the hands and mouthpiece of God and deliver hugs and words of encouragement and consolation and argue lovingly about the ideas of how we can make this world better better and safer that's what God is doing that's how God loves you and did you want to say anything that I missed anything? Because you sure can. <laughs> well, in that case, I've got to find the, and like I said, I have more stories, but I'm going to cut it off. And I believe it's the special music people find late. <laughs>
want to be present in all of these situations, in all of these lives, in all of these families. And Lord, we are bold to ask for even more. That you not only just heal us of our hurt, but that you show us a better way to live in our day-to-day -day experiences. That you teach us, that you guide us, that you lead us, as you have always done and are continuing to do. But open our eyes, unstop our ears, tune our minds to pay attention to you. Help us to follow you more quickly, to listen attentively, to have our eyes open to the ways you are guiding us every day on a better path. Not the one that we want to take necessarily, but the one you have for us. Thank you. We lift all of these concerns up to you. And we praise you that you are ready into a new life. And so we ask all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are actually not going to be saying the Lord's Prayer. And the reason we're not is in a few minutes they are going to beautifully, beautifully sing it. Let us commend Lincoln Scott Lessman to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your child Lincoln. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Thank you for receiving Lincoln into the arms of your mercy into the blessed rest of everlasting life, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen.
You guys stay close to your microphone because you can help lead this next song. How many of you, I hope you know it, we're going to be um, feasting in paradise. Your family's inviting you to a luncheon immediately afterwards. But at this time, there are some kids that have a special job, and this is your moment to go and get them busy. And um, they have something they're going to give you to remind you that Jesus loves you. And it's from the Lincoln's family and loved ones. And um, Logan might want to do it. He learned how he practiced, so it's up to him. And poor little, uh, you guys forgot Mila. She's here alone. Somebody's, no, go ahead, just hurry back. Hurry back. They're all trying to turn around and come get her. So, all right. Now, everybody that can sing, you know, tell me. <laughs> At my church, they know to turn my microphone off when I'm trying to sing. Yeah. So you didn't know that. You're supposed to turn me off when I was kind of singing. All right. Be present at our table, Lord. set up as a buffet line um, through the kitchenette. So family, um, after we place Lincoln into the hearse, we'll come back inside and I'll just have you guys start that line. And then everybody else, you're welcome to, to follow. Um, we have seating for about 80 in the lunchroom. So for the rest of you, you're welcome to stay. We have enough food for everybody. We just don't, might not have enough tables. Um, so you're welcome to come in here and just you know sit with the food on your lap. You know, we have sandwiches and chips, so it should be pretty easy to to transport, okay? So like I said, um, casket bearers, I'll have you come forward, and then those of you in the lunchroom, um, if you don't mind clearing out, and we will come be back in in just a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 